Okay, hello students. In this session, we will talk about three more topics, um, parameter passings, method for class type, and inline member functions, and array decay. So um, let's begin. So first, let's talk about parameter passing methods. Uh, we have already learned two different types of parameter passing methods, call by value and call by reference. Uh, we learned that copy of actual value of argument is passed to the functions if we use call by value parameter passing method. And on the other hand, only the address of argument is passed to the functions if we use call by reference um, passing method. So in which situation we should use call by value and call by reference? Obviously, if caller functions needed to change the local variables of caller functions, call by reference should be used um, because caller functions cannot access the local variables of caller function if we use the call by value method. Um, but there are another reasons to use call by reference. Um, the efficiency is the reasons. For the simple types of parameters, such as um, int or double, whether you use call by value or call by reference, the difference in efficiency is um, negligible. But for class parameters, it is more efficient to use call by reference um, passing method. Um, because usually class is large data type, it includes number of member variables and functions. So obviously it is larger than simple data types such as int or double. So if we use call by value for class type parameters, the copy of call, the, sorry, um, the, cop, the copy of class argument is passes to the quality functions. Therefore, there will be two copy of class argument. But if we use call by reference, only the address of class argument is passed to the quality functions. So there will be just one copy of class argument. So this is the reason why um, call by reference is more efficient in larger data type. Um, it is more efficient because there will be one copy of arguments and there will be no copy operations if we use a call by reference parameter passing method. Um, but one problem of using call by reference is that the curly function may accidentally modify the parameters, which will also affect the local variable of caller functions. So if you, you, if you are using a call by reference parameter, and wants to make sure that curly function does not modify the parameter, you can mark the parameter as constants. Um, you can do that by placing const keyword before the parameter type. So like this one, bank account is class type. And because we put ampersand here, it is called by reference parameters and by placing const keyword before the type like this one, we can make uh, this account one as constants. So we call this um, as constant call by reference parameter. Constants call by reference parameter is um, read only. Um, it cannot be modified. Attempting to modify such parameter will lead to compiler error. Okay, so that's uh, constants call by reference parameters. Um, I would like to talk about the um, inline function in class. Again, we already learned what inline function is in week four when we were discussing about functions. Um, quickly recall it, inline function is the function where the compiler insert the function definitions at the place where um, its function call is made. So by doing this, the overhead of function core can be eliminated. So your program becomes more efficient. And to make inline function, you, you use an inline keyword like this one. 
and because in line, um, because its function body is inserted in place where function core is made, generally we use inline functions for the small functions. So that's inline functions. We've already learned this in week four. Um, we can also make the member function in line. The member function is different to ordinary function. Member function is the function in the class. And I said that we typically place the definition of member function outside of the class definitions. Uh, we only put the member function declaration inside of the class definition like this one. So um, that's what this line is talking about. Um, but you can give the definition of member function within the definition of this class. And that is how you make the inline member functions. Um, you do not use inline keyword for member functions. If you just put the definition of the function within the class definitions, compiler treat that member function as inline member functions. And just like other inline functions, the code for an inline member function is inserted at each place where the member function is invoked. So if you look at this example code, um, the test is a member function and no inline function is also a member function of this day of year class. Um, but the, um, the test member function is inline member function because its definitions is within um, this class definitions. Um, this member function is this one, the, this member function is not in line because its definition is placed outside of the class definition. Class definition starts from here to here. So um, the definition of this function is here because, because of this, this one is not in line. And because definition of this member function is here, so test is are in line member functions. And only short function should be defined in line. Otherwise, the large piece of code will be repeated frequently in your program, uh, which is a bad. And if you use inline member function, uh, this has the disadvantages of mixing the interface and implementation of class, which violates principle of encapsulation. So here it mixed the interfaces and the detailed implementations here. So it's not a good design of the class. So there is a pros and cons for using inline member functions. You should be aware of them and make good decision when to use them. Okay, now let's talk about the um, array decay. This is nothing to do with class. Um, it's good to know. So I'm introducing it briefly in these sessions. And this is um, relates to the um, programming assignment one. So, um, so, so let's begin. So first, what is array decay? We say array decay when we lose array informations. So um, this typically happens when we pass an array into other functions. So if you look at this example, there is an array size of five, and we pass this array to F1 functions. Array decay happens here because we send first argument, I mean, first address of the array to um, these F1 functions. And because the first address of the array is just pointer, um, here we lose information of array for example, the size of the array is lost here. And that's because this is uh, just pointer, not an array. So um, let's see the differences between pointer and array using a demo code. Um, let me first compile this program. run it. So this is the demo code for showing array decay. We have a array 
size of five, and we print the size of this array here. And then we pass this array to this decay func. And inside of this decay func, we also print the uh, given argument, which is this array. And this is the output, as you can see here, the actual size of this array is 20. That's because this is a int types of array. And because there is a five um, element, um, the size of int is four bytes. And if we, because there is a five, five times four is 20. So that is the reason why this um, size of array is 20. And, but the, um, we pass the array to these functions and we print these um, arguments, this array. This is a pointer, but we pass the array and we print the size of these arguments. As you can see here, its size is not, not 20, it's eight. That's because um, this is just pointer, not an array. And the size of pointer in 64-bit machine is eight bytes. So that is the reason why it prints eight. So array decay happens here. Even though we pass the array, this is not an array anymore, it's just pointer. So we lose um, the size, length of the array or other um, information stored in the array, data structures. So that's what array decay is. So let's go back to the slides. So then how can we prevent array decay? There are two ways to avoid array decay. The first solution is to pass both array and the size of array into the target functions. This is a very simple solution. If you look at this example code, um, unlike previous example, F1 functions now receive both array, which is a pointer, and the size of array as a second argument. Because you now know the size of the given array, it doesn't matter whether we lose the array information due to the array decays. Um, as you can see here, you can still iterate the array using the given pointer based on the given size information. So you can use a for loop and iterate just like an array using this pointer if we know the actual size of the array like this one. So this is the how you can um, avoid array decay program. The another method to prevent array decay is to pass the array into function by reference. So um, the F2 function received the array reference and this will prevent automatic conversions of array into a pointer and thus prevents array decay. So here, because this is an array reference, uh, you can use it just like an array. Uh, we can iterate it because size of or the other array information is not lost. So you can directly use this ARR argument in range-based volume like this one. No information is lost if we use a um, reference. So this two, by using these two methods, you can avoid the um, array decay problem. So um, if array decay happens, you cannot use a range-based for loop. Um, this is a ARR is a pointer as we talked about in previous slides. This is not an array due to the array decay. Um, if you try to iterate this pointer with range-based for loop, like this one, the compiler error occurs. And this is the compiler error message. It says that no um, viable begin functions available. So what does this mean? So this is relating to the um, programming assignments one, program one. So the pro program assignments ask you to iterate this um, pointer using range-based for loop. 
but as you can see here, if we directly use this pointer, um, compiler error occurs here, saying this error message because of the um, array decay problem we just learned in the previous slide. So how can we um, iterate this pointer using this range-based for loop? How can we do that? So that was the uh, problems of pro program assignment one. So let's first understand what this compiler error is talking about. No viable begin function available. Um, if we search how to use range-based for loop um, through Google, um, this is a cppreference.com site. Uh, from here, we can see the syntax of range-based for loop. So this is the syntax. As you can see here, it has a induce statement, which is an optional. We put the range declarations and column, and we put the range expressions, and the loop statements goes here. So this here we put the array. As you can see here, we put the array here. This is a range expression. Is this one? Um, sorry, it's here. And the range expressions for the range based for loop should be either an array or an object for which begin and end member functions. So we should only put um, array in this range expressions, or we should put the object that consists of um, begin and end member functions. So what's begin and end member functions? Um, if we look at the vector, we will talk about vector in later weeks. Um, vector is just class. Um, as you can see here, it has a begin and end member functions. This is a class and it has a member function named begin and end. Similarly, C++ also provide array class. Um, this is array class also has a begin and end member functions. Um, because vector and array has begin and end member functions, uh, we can iterate vector and array using a range-based for loop. So we can say that range-based for loop use this begin and end member functions internally. So in order to use a range-based for loop, there must be begin and end member functions. That's what we can find the information in the Google. Um, but this pointer is neither array or objects with begin and end member functions. So we cannot use it uh, with range-based for loop. This is a just pointer. Then how can we use this pointer in range-based for loop? It is possible to use range-based for loop because we know the size of the array. We know the size of the array because we passed to the size of the array as a second argument. Uh, because we know the size of the array, we can cast this pointer to array pointer or array reference and use range-based for loop to iterate it. So here we cast ARR to array pointer and use it in the range-based for loop. So this is ethnically correct. And here we cast ARR to array reference and use it in range-based for loop. So um, if you solve the program assignment one like this way, um, you will not lose any points. Um, these two are the simplest way of solving program assignments one. Um, there may be other ways to be iterate ARR pointer using the range-based for loop. So you will still not lose any points if you use this ARR point inside of this range-based for loop. So um, that is the array decay and a uh, little bit more detailed information about the uh, range-based for loop. So in summary, in this session, we learned parameter passing method. Uh, we talk about that it should be more efficient to use core by reference parameter method if we pass the class types of arguments. And 
we also talk about the um, inline member function. If we put the definition of member function within the class definition, that member function becomes the inline member functions. Uh, for the member function, we do not use the inline keyword. And we also talk about the um, array decay. This is about losing the array information. Okay, that's it for this week. Um, see you in next week.